My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Finicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Daniel Engerer coming in from Detroit, Michigan. You can find his work on weloveliberty.com. That's his blog. And he has a podcast that he has with a guy called Michael, uh, Flagship Freedom. Uh, you, if you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, the website is flagshipfreedom.blueberry. And that's blue without the E, blueberry. Don't get it wrong. He'll, he'll get angry. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find his podcast on Facebook, on Twitter, and you can um, um, on podcasters like, like iTunes and Stitcher. And they also upload the, the uh, episodes on YouTube if you're one of those old-fashioned guys. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about his background, how he came to the beautiful world of altruism. And um, one of his episodes that, that was a, a favorite of his, Status Bingo, where they talk about a hodgepodge of various common status arguments. And uh, he wrote a little article called Arguments for State Legitimacy, Rebutted. And, and then we'll touch upon um, the idea of why some libertarians support Trump, ironically enough. So uh, we'll see what's going on with that. So, uh, Daniel, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm starstruck. <laughs> and uh, I've enjoyed peaceful anarchism for some time now, so pleasure to be here. No problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you sent me one of your episodes, I think. Um, was it the first one, or the second one, something like that? And oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, and I checked it out, and like, I like these guys. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, every, every episode, you you know, I like, I really like your intro. I have to say, really cool intro. You know. Um, was that who made that? By the way, did Michael make that, or you had someone? You know, we both did. We wanted to keep a cool futuristic theme. Oh, it was. Uh, something different. So uh, something like shooting off into space to go battle uh, statist aliens or something like that. <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, so I, I checked out a couple of your, your initial episodes as well as the statist bingo. And uh, yeah, really cool, um, calm, logical, rational arguments and uh, you know a presentation. And so I really appreciate that. And also... You know, we all start off from uh, very modest, humble beginnings, and so it's nice to see other people starting up with their podcasts. And so as, I do as much as I can to help other people who are starting their podcasts because, uh, you know, I started with. I remember, I remember on YouTube when I got my first subscriber, I'm like, "What? One sub <laughs> somebody subscribed to me? <laughs> Someone's interested in what I'm doing." <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty exciting. So, um, but yeah, awesome stuff and. Uh, I'm trying to help you uh, gain more exposure. So, so yeah. So before we get into all your all the podcast, uh, can you go into your background and how you came across this philosophy and um, what um, books or podcasts or personalities um, influence you along the way? Yeah, definitely. So it all started in college, and um, I was sort of racked with this. I don't know. You could call it liberal guilt. Uh, I I always felt this this undeserving that uh, why why was I living in comfort and prosperity and uh, why were there other people in the world who were dirt poor like you're always hearing and seeing these uh, stories about Africa and you know you get kind of jaded you're like oh, yeah they're poor yeah we got to send them money but eventually you sort of ask or I, I finally thought why there's got to be a reason for this like it's 
there, there must be an explanation. It can't possibly be just happenstance that some places in the world are prosperous and others are not. Uh, you know, you, you have a way of getting used to that as a kid growing up, you know, it, it becomes normal to you. Anyways, I, I started researching it and I stumbled upon an article that uh, explained it as a function of economic freedom. And that is what kind of got me going down the rabbit hole. It was a concept I had never even heard of considered. Liberty was not even like an idea for me. It was not even a concept. So uh, from there, somehow I managed to find my way onto YouTube, uh, found some Thomas Sowell videos, and those really spoke to me. I don't know, you could say it confirmed my bias, the, the way I viewed the world. Uh, I like to think that it actually was just uh, logically consistent and that appealed to me because it actually made sense. And um, from there, John Stossel, et cetera. And I, I uncovered and discovered that I was incredibly um, like hungry for this topic. Like I, I used to always view politics as the most boring, like I don't ever want to have anything to do with it. Uh, I always laughed at my brother who would, who's watching YouTube videos of politicians. I thought like, you have no life. This is the most boring thing I can imagine. But all of a sudden now I'm sucked into it and I'm like absolutely addicted. Uh, and the more, the closer I got to the true whittled down uh, pure message of liberty, the more addictive it was, oddly. So uh, let's see, to, to finally get to the uh, bitter truth uh, of voluntarism, I was going to a Students for Liberty conference. I was invited by my anarchist friend, and we were all taking a bus down there to D.C., and uh, there were a few kids in the back talking about no government. And immediately I was like, okay, guys, I, I realize limited government, you know, <laughs> capitalism, free markets, but that's nuts. That's crazy. <laughs> and I made all the exact same arguments, like, I, I actually remember I I said, well, what about the hermit who's going to set up landmines in his front yard and mm. the little girl's going to wander on there and get blown up? All the same ridiculous arguments <laughs> now that we laugh at I was making. But um, they planted the seed in my head and uh, it was very uncomfortable. And it took me over a year of just walking and thinking. I had a lot of time walking to class uh, in college to do some soul searching and think about it. And just one after another, the arguments fell. And uh, finally, one day, uh, it all sort of, I don't want to say it clicked. It was a very gradual process. But uh, eventually, you know, you um, you can no longer hold up the house of cards. So that's how I got there. Wow, awesome. Um, yeah, that's interesting when you, when you talk about viewing other um, countries or cultures that are that are wanting, you know, and pr living in privation as compared to the way we live. And yeah, you, and, and you begin to, you know, take it as, um, yeah, that's just reality, right? But but then you, when you learn about this whole other side called economics and capitalism and why are certain countries excelling so much, you know, uh, you know, you look at this thing, it's the, um, is, is it the... Um, it's like the economic um, indicator. Uh, you know, they rank all the countries yeah. according to the freedom economic. index. Right, right, freedom index. And like, how is it? Hong Kong and uh, what, what other countries? Singapore, New Zealand, or Singapore, right? Yeah, so like, like mm -hmm. really, really high. And uh, and how like and how I think John Stossel made a video like how quickly or how yeah how quickly it is to, to start a business in Hong Kong <laughs> as opposed to like I don't know United States or you know other places and uh, and it's fascinating and um and like yeah so 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 some countries are basically um they're like condemned to poverty right because they, they, you know, they don't live in a state contrary to what most people say. You want anarchy? Go to Somalia. No, actually, Somalia is not <laughs> is not anarchy in the way that we mean, right? It's just like more, more like a dictatorship. Or if the dictatorship is not there, it's the absence of a dictatorship, waiting for the next dictatorship to come around. <laughs> so no, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say on Somalia, it's. It does no good if everybody believes in the state and nobody understands non-aggression and property rights. So, right, it's it's like the uh, Stefan Molyneux um, atheist example. If the church burns down, doesn't make you an atheist. Exactly, exactly. That's the argument that I I love to make is that um, 
if if a revolution happens, no, that doesn't produce a, a, a society of volunteers. No, <laughs> just because they assassinated the king, no, that's not going to make everyone automatically understand your property rights and non-aggression and self-ownership. In the same way that you know, in like 15th century uh, Europe, if you like murdered all the the priests and the and the cardinals and the dukes and the and the uh, and the pope. You know, <laughs> you're not going to produce a society of people that understand fundamentally atheism. <laughs> either. You know, it's just a lack of leaders. That's it. A lack of rulers, I'll say. Yeah. And it's really tempting to want to topple the government because it's, you know, look, it's the government. They're the ones who are taking my tax money. They're the ones who are right. oppressing me. Right. Just kill them and get it over. With. No, because the, the seed is still there. And in, but that should be good news to us because we don't have to have a war. We don't have to fight the IRS. Mm. All we have to do is go in there like a surgeon and take out that little contradiction <laughs> and the whole thing comes crashing down. So it's good. Oh, you know, it's so beautiful. That's that's definitely my approach is that, um, you know, people often tell me, why, Danilo, why are you so focused on philosophy and morality and economics? This is like, this is not reality. This is just like <laughs> thoughts. These are just up here. I'm concerned about reality. Why don't you pay attention to what's going on right now? <laughs> <laughs> and my my question is, well, wh why do you think people act the way they act, right? Everybody has an ideology, a set of principles by which they act, right? And so my question is, what are your principles? What are your ideologies, right? And if we can address those directly uh, as to as with as many people as possible, we can f change reality. We can change fundamentally how people behave and what they, you know, what kinds of institutions they empower such as the state right <clears throat> so it's so important that we have these conversations because you know like you said you know if you just remove the figurehead it doesn't change anything of what the people are thinking right because they are just symptoms of state you know the idea of statism in their mind right that's it they're the physical manifestations of statism <laughs> people want to be ruled they want the state because they believe it's legitimate Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's it's always helpful to remember where you came from. Like I I voted for McCain and Palin in 2008. I actually voted against the legalization of uh, medical marijuana. I do remember during Obama's first term. Mm. That was one of the items. And like I, I wanted to keep that illegal. And I didn't even really it didn't register to me like that means you want peaceful people to go to jail mm. for taking a substance in a body that they own. Mm -hmm. And to me now that's, that's kind of shocking. Like I, I was gung ho pro military. Uh, it just doesn't occur to people, you know, so it may not even be that they, you know, now we get the impression that they're just worship authority and they love the state. But, um, in hindsight, I know my problem was just that I, no one had ever even presented it to me. You know, you're just adrift in the ocean of propaganda and all it takes is somebody to reach out and uh, give you that little drop of truth and you know you set them free and before you know it they realize the cage they're in yeah yeah it's it's really amazing and i i really um admire you know all of the the truth seekers the volunteers the anarchists um the people that are not afraid to have an unpopular opinion right because i think that's a fundamental fear that gets instilled into all of us is the desire to conform right to be part of the tribe and and uh, the fear of being ostracized by the tribe is a very deep seated fear um, that I think goes back goes way back uh, in our in our DNA in our genes. And so to be the person to say you know the emperor has no clothes, you know the state is a lie. The, you know the borders are a fiction. Politicians are just sociopaths. Law is an opinion with a gun. <laughs> you know you you have the you have the um, you you run the risk of being you know metaphorically stoned. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I've definitely lost more friends than gained, I would say. But you know what? Oh well, it, it, they weren't adding a whole lot to my life, anyways. And uh, yeah, you can just sort of gauge it by your Facebook likes on your post. It just steadily goes down over the years. And <laughs> you wonder how many people have unfriended you, but you know what? <laughs> Who cares? I I would never change it i wouldn't change it for the world uh to to look back and to uh imagine you know not having this kind of fundamental truth this way this lens through uh which to view the world 
to understand that voluntary human interaction, win-win transactions, capitalism, prosperity, freedom, I mean, those are like such precious truths that, uh, I don't know, it's embarrassing to think back and to realize you were just one of the faceless uh, masses worshiping the government <laughs> well we all start somewhere right <laughs> right so uh so yeah please get into the the episode the status bingo and uh and, and what, what that was about so this particular episode uh we bring up we try to address all of the frequently frequently asked questions and if you are an anarchist you may be familiar with a funny meme picture called status bingo and in any argument with a staunch statist you will inevitably hit four or five very popular arguments, like who would build the roads uh, without government warlords would take over. Uh, what else is there? Uh, you consent to taxation because you live here. All of the very, very cliche arguments that we've become extremely accustomed to. So we thought, you know, uh, we need to address these uh, head on. Like I'm a, my personal approach to gain more converts, so to speak, to the movement is to just address and bombard and absolutely wreck every single argument that they have, uh, you know, come back 10 times stronger. So basically leave them no uh, ground to stand on. So take all the arguments and we will take them apart one by one. So let's see, the first one was one of the most common. Uh, doesn't anarchy de just depend on everybody being like perfect? Mm. Like right. you, nobody's going to obey the non-aggression principle. Like it sounds really nice, of course, but who's going to follow that? I didn't sign the NAP. <laughs> right, right, oh, right. Yeah, you're trying to force voluntary. <laughs> yeah, just, I'm trying to force me to believe your, your ridiculous ideas. Come on. <laughs> yeah, never mind that you can't force somebody into a voluntary situation. <laughs> exactly. But anyways, uh, so there was there was that argument. Another one was you consent to it, uh, to government and democracy by living here. So, uh, you know, you just got to take these apart one by one. And eventually people are confronted with their own irrationality. Like you have to take away each and every one of their um, excuses, right? Until they finally cannot deny, or they cannot, they can no longer ignore the fact that they are simply clinging to emotion. And, uh, you know, one thing that people will do, and I, I did this myself for years, is when they have a message that they want to believe in, they will take the most unlikely shred of evidence and say, oh, yep, okay, I don't have to uh, question my worldview because they didn't answer this one little question and I can throw the entire thing out, <laughs> right? Like people are biased. People want to believe what they want to believe. Right. And um, you, you just have to take that away from them, as uncomfortable as it is. Yeah. So, uh, so two things about what you said. The first thing is, um, when I talk to people and they present these arguments, um, I, I, I try to become, I try to come down to basics, right? So I establish basic definitions, like whatever word they use, you know, um, capitalism, what is uh, free markets? What is the state? What is the law? You know, um, basic stuff like that. What is socialism? Very, very important to define that one. <laughs> um, because, I think so many, so so much of, um, let's see, so, uh, uh, people not understanding what you say is derived by a, a confusion of terms, so basic terms, right? And so y y you're both just talking past each other. And so once you basically define terms, or what's taxation too, once you have a basic definition of terms, a lot can be just cleared up just with that, <laughs> you know? Um, and... Uh, and what was the other one you were talking about? Um, I forgot. What, 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 you, 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 were, you were talking about, what were you, what were you talking about? Well, uh, addressing each and every one of their arguments, there was you consent, the implied consent to social contract by living right. here. Right. There was, um, let's see, the first point. I don't even remember what I said, okay. right? It was yeah. uh, that, that, that we depend on everybody's goodwill. Uh, in a system of voluntarism. Yeah, yeah. They confuse it with volunteerism. They think it's right, I've heard like, that oh, too. volunteering at a soup kitchen. I've heard that too, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, 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 it's very strange you know, when, when they say, you know, um, oh, 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 right, what, what you said about um, if, you, if, if, um, if you can't explain this one thing, 
then that invalidates every other, everything else that you say. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's just so amazing to me because I don't. I've never met one voluntarist or anarchist that's that claims to know the future. Right? Is a fortune teller? Mm -hmm. Is an oracle? None of that. <laughs> to me, I distill our philosophy down to basic principles, which is um, we advocate for voluntary interactions between consensual. Uh, or, yeah, between consenting and peaceful individuals. That's it. And we condemn the initiation of force as it is um, distinguished between um, be, between or from the uh, self-defense, right? Very important distinction. People, people commonly <laughs> uh, misconstrue those two things as well. Um, that's it. Basic definition, right? I'm not saying that I know the future. I'm not saying I know who's going to feed the poor, how we're going to help the, 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 the sick or the elderly, or how we're going to educate kids. No, I'm not saying any of that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I advocate um, <clears throat> I advocate that nobody be raped. Okay, so what are you going to do if there's a back alley and a guy and a woman and there's no police? I don't know. I'm not there. You know, <laughs> well, well, That's a hypothetical, ridiculous rabbit hole. I'm just saying a principle that this is what I support in the same way that an abolitionist in 19th century said, they, they, they said, all we're saying is slavery is wrong. You can't own mm -hmm. another human being. I'm not saying I know the future, how the cotton will be picked. I'm not saying I know, or they, they're, they're not saying they knew that the huge machines would be built so that, <laughs> you know, that would catapult um, the harvesting of, of crops. No, they're not saying any of that. <laughs> so it's completely, it's completely irrelevant. <laughs> And on that topic, um, it, it doesn't even require uh, huge, sophisticated farm equipment. All it requires is paying people to pick the cotton, right? Mm. It, it's as simple as that. And I remember Stefan Molyneux went on the Joe Rogan show, and they were he was asking, well, what about uh, national defense or nuclear bombs and things like that? Or how are we going to have defense? And it was, it was killing me to watch watch this because Steph went on this big complicated uh, sidebar like well you see there's technology that can sense people's fingerprints and their DNA and there's missiles that will uh, you know only go towards the person you want to kill and it's like no 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 you don't have to write a science fiction novel <laughs> just say it's a service a that fiction. people want and are willing to pay for period <laughs> we don't need tractors we don't need anything uh, to get rid of slavery and on that note, uh, I'm not too uh, well versed in the history back then, but were there people really arguing uh, or I suppose what percentage of people were actually making legitimate, uh, honest arguments like, well, who's how are we going to have a farm economy without slaves, uh, et cetera? Like to me, to us, that's shocking. That's like shockingly immoral right. and right. it's bald faced uh, excuses. But, you know, uh, when you take a step back, statism is kind of the same way. The analogy is the exact same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the the whole idea of um, if zero percent taxation is complete freedom, hundred percent taxation is complete slavery. At what percentage is it not slavery, right? And uh, and I would argue at no percent, right? Because um, if you're if you're um, coerced into giving a portion of your income, doesn't matter how much it is, it is by force. And and my question always is, you know, it's like a, it's like when somebody says there should be a law. You know, there should be a law for this, <laughs> you know, and of course, you know, they have it out of the kindness of their hearts, you know, they want to be benevolent and help people. But in the end, all you're doing is pointing more guns at people. And my question is, well, what if they don't follow the law? What are you going to do? You know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, there should be a law. Everybody eats their vegetables. You know, <laughs> two servings of vegetables a day. Okay, but what if somebody has one? <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to beat them up? You're going to tase them? You're going to drag them off to jail? <laughs> Is that justified? You know? So I think when people, that's one of our, that's one of our main jobs, I think, is to expose the gun in the room, right? Just peel back the curtain of, of uh, respectability that the state has, right? Strip all of these political euphemisms, right? Taxation. It's not taxation. It's just theft. It's not the war on terror. It's just mass murder. It's not. It's not getting pulled over by a cop. It's a. It, it's a. It's a death threat. <laughs> you know. You know. We just have to peel back these these pleasant sounding words and and just state it as it is. Yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, you know, now that we've been exposed to the message of liberty for years now, it's it's become kind of natural. But you, it, it's just 
people are just neck deep. They're up to their eyeballs in propaganda and excuses. And, uh, you know, we can see because we were there. I, I'm sure you you made some of those same arguments. So I, I guess it, it goes a long way to be uh, empathetic, as frustrating as it can be. And I get incredibly irritated with people. You know, if I had like myself, somebody to walk through these arguments with me previously, like uh, what a luxury that would have been. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's our job. That's that's what we're here to do is to just help people see over the horizon. We've been um, fortunate enough to have people uh, point out our own irrationalities. And, you know, we one thing that is helpful for me is to it's easy to put people in boxes and and say like you're evil and and you're bad because you think this and you support that but like what if what if you were born or what if you were the terrorist like i think people were all capable of doing evil things and having bad arguments in our heads so it helps to realize that all of these capacities for evil are within me and it's really just about unlocking the puzzle and finding out you know what makes the human mind tick and we've just got to go in there and tweak a couple things and, you know, let let the gears start turning again, uh, because right now there's some dysfunction. But uh, it's it's not not that much of an overhaul to go in there and get their logic machines working, working again. And, you know, then they're off to the races. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I completely agree. There's a there's a guy in, on, uh, on Facebook, um, Sterling Lujan. I don't know if you follow him from the Psychologic Anarchist. Um, he's an awesome, awesome anarchist, and he promotes what he calls relational anarchism or soft anarchism or compassionate anarchism. And his focus is primarily on communication. You know, he's like, I don't talk about mm -hmm. logic. I don't talk about economics or free markets, although I support that stuff and, and also capitalism. He's like, I support all that stuff. But, you know, you can go to 100 other podcasts to listen to that. But what I talk about is how do you communicate? Because he comes at it from a psychological perspective. And so he's like, how do you how do we bridge this gap? Because most of the time, um, these beliefs are not there um, because they examined every other belief system in the world. No, most people believe in the state because they were brought up to believe in the state. <laughs> you know, that's what we, just that's just what you get when you when you go to government school. So they didn't arrive at it through a process of logic and deduction, right? And so, how difficult must be the the task to correct it when applying just logic and deduction right so it's so important when we talk to people um this is kind of what i do is i try to find the common ground so i'm not just like fighting them like you're wrong this is why you're wrong no because then they're gonna be put on the defensive and they're gonna you know they're gonna get angry pretty much and put up their barriers and then you're not gonna get anything in they're just gonna hold their ground um but to try to get through with them by saying you know i agree with you i also want to help the poor i also um want to help sick people you know uh, I also want to help addicted people if they have problems, but this is not the right way. We're making it worse, right? Um, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that's an incredibly valuable point. I think that could be one of the most important uh, tips or helpful approaches for convincing people is to get on their side. Like as soon as you threaten somebody's ego mm. or you're going to humiliate them online, mm. they just clam up mm -hmm. like there's no tomorrow and they will <laughs> – like fight tooth and nail and and pull up every single article they can possibly unearth, which, you know, there's a time and place for that. But it's so very true. I think if you just find something that they care about, and because we we have an answer for everybody, almost everybody, right? Like, well, uh, you know, we can appeal to leftists, we can appeal to people on the right. Uh, there's at least one topic that we can we can go to somebody and say, hey, I actually have a better solution. And, and let me tell you how I can help out with the thing that you are passionate about. Mm. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's really so important. And, and it reminds me of this is an analogy that one of my, um, one of my friends told me is that in, in everybody's mind, there's a man on an elephant, right? And so the man represents the logic, the rational, the, the, the reason side of your brain and the elephant represents the emotional side. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, so many people are just talking to the, to the man 
And and then you know you're telling the man go left, go left, go left, and he's like, all right, I'm gonna go left, and the, and the elephant goes right. What are you gonna do about it? Nothing. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> so it's a great analogy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's it's so it's so important that we um, you know, that we allay their fears, that we calm them down, we assure them. Yes, we also want the same things you do, but you have to realize you're not being compassionate by forcing other people to you know, to forfeit their, the fruits of their labor at gunpoint. That's not compassionate. That's called a mugging. <laughs> That's called theft, <laughs> right? So you got to have clear definitions of these things in your mind so that we can proceed forward and talk about more complicated things like national defense, like the roads, <laughs> like, you know, once you get past all that stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, please go into your, your article, um, Arguments for State Legitimacy, and, uh, and what that was about. Uh, so on my blog, We Love Liberty, uh, my goal was to create a central, not central, but a resource where I could, because I kept arguing the same points over and over again. I wanted to create something that I could fall back on uh, that was had rock solid, airtight arguments, but it was still um, palatable for the layman. Like it, it wasn't reading a PhD thesis. It was straightforward, common sense stuff, but it was still you know, very thorough. So uh, I just, I kept getting, as you debate more and more people, they have an answer for everything. So my re, my uh, response to that is to reply, is to retort. Like I said earlier, uh, if, you, if you don't address each and every one of their fears, then bingo, like they're going to walk away thinking that they won. And uh, I don't know, that really killed me. Like I could never not have the last word that drove <laughs> me up the wall. So, you know, the least I could do is write down, uh, you know, and document all of these arguments from a logical standpoint. I don't think that's too much to ask for somebody who is genuinely seeking the truth and say like, Hey, here, X, Y, Z, um, you've been brought up to believe a lot of false concepts and uh, we're just going to deconstruct them one after one so this article arguments for state legitimacy um whenever you say taxation is theft government is immoral you people come at you with a barrage of no it's actually voluntary no it's completely legitimate like it's a club that you have to pay dues for mm -hmm. or uh democracy means that it legitimizes it or the fact that there's a constitution or the fact that you are living here on this land therefore you consent to government action so there's or there, there's even more there's that government owns all the land government owns the money so these are all may seem to have some face value but you just dive down and deconstruct them one after another so that's what i'm all about is uh the logical side as you know, it's not the be all end all. Like you said, there's a lot to be said for emotion and communication. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I like to ha think that there's still some rationality out there. So for me, it's all about laying the bedrock, the foundation. So as soon as somebody comes at you with an argument, you say, oh, sorry, I already got that one covered. Check out the blog and come back when you're ready, because <laughs> we, we've already covered that topic um, thoroughly start to finish. And uh, I don't know, it, may, it lets me sleep well at night knowing that I've thrown some truth out there. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's so important to to document your, your thoughts on these things. Um, yeah, it's so important for us to have a blog and, and your podcast, too, is functioning as this as, as well. You're like, you know, check out this episode. We we covered this topic in detail and and um, I think it lends a lot of credibility that you're not just you're not just speaking, you know, momentarily about this stuff you're like i really put some thought into it i actually wrote it down or i did a podcast episode <laughs> i'm really serious about this um and i think i'm very similar in in your uh in your method you know focusing on logic logic and reason and principles and definitions and um you know things like that and very calmly talking to people you know making sure not they're, they don't get emotional they don't get angry they don't erect those barriers um, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, slowly I'm also understanding the, the importance of communication and, and how important it is to establish a connection. But, but yeah, like, like you, I think we were talking before in that, um, many people around me, <laughs> many family members accuse me of, of not having any emotions. <laughs> They're like, are you human? You don't get angry ever. What, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, apparently 
if I don't get angry, that means I don't have emotions. It's kind of an interesting way to look at life. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, I noticed you, you have a very uh, positive outlook. That, that's the sense that I get from you. And that's actually what immediately drew me to your channel in the first place. It was called Peaceful Anarchism. And it actually had a smiling face, not like <laughs> all these, you know, militant, you know, destroy the state taxation is theft, you know, that that can get wearisome after a while. And I'm guilty of that. But it, it really diffuses people. You, you like, hey, I'm not here to crush your worldview, you know, as, as or maybe I'm going to do so, but not in a uh, I'll do it behind your back and you won't even know it. You know, it's sort of like, how do you get somebody to remove their jacket? If you were Mother Nature, you could uh, try to blow it off using the wind and rain and, and snow, but they're just going to hold on to it tighter. Right. Or you could be like the sun that right. warms them up, and then, oh, they just take it off. <laughs> it's really disarming. So that, I, I do enjoy that about your uh, your style. I don't know how much of that is intentional. I, I think it's in your personality, but it, it goes a long way. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, um, I definitely inject a lot of... Um comedy and lightheartedness i have a background in stand-up comedy i did it for a year um it was a lot of fun i definitely recommend oh. it i highly recommend you do it it's a it's a very um self <laughs> self-discovering experience um the idea of self-deprecation laughing at ourselves you know if if um <clears throat> you know if you can't laugh at yourself um you're just gonna get mad when everyone else does <laughs> so <laughs> you should be the first one poke fun at yourself right um uh, you know because we're all fallible we all we're all human beings we're all imperfect we're all just trying to figure out this thing called life. Um, and so, yeah, so that was a wonderful experience. And I think I bring that that comedy because, you know, I just used comedy. Like, whenever I meet somebody new, like, it, you know, it's, it's always a little bit of tension when you meet a new person. And so my goal when I meet somebody new is to make them laugh as soon as possible. That's my goal. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so I'm, I'm quick with the jokes and everything. And so I think I apply that as well to uh my conversations with status and um you know you know of course absent any name calling you know st no straw man of course none of that stuff you know you just talk to them as a human being and, and you relate to them as much as possible and, and crack as many jokes and get them laughing again because once they laugh then they just their the guard goes down they trust you they they're more willing to listen to what you have to say because they're like oh this person's nice made me laugh <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, so yeah. yeah that's that's definitely my approach um <clears throat> so well, well, the the so the specific arguments uh, i guess we, we we probably touched on them right yeah, that you talked about in that article yeah yeah there was uh let's see you know i could actually bring it up right now but there's uh the arguments that uh, i i address are land ownership so uh it boils down to the idea of your house your rules and if if government can tell you what to do, then that implies that they own your land or they have some superior claim than you. Mm. And that contradicts the whole concept of private property. And it implies the government owns everything. And I don't think anybody believes that, not even the government. So you have to square that circle somehow. And uh, to the idea that government owns it all, that is historically and logically false. So that's that's one argument. Democracy, I mean, that's that doesn't even take five seconds, right? Like, oh, we, we all got together and we agreed on it. Well, I didn't. And I also never agreed to be um, bound by the rules of this of this vote. Right. And uh, so that there comes the idea of implied consent. Mm. Like, oh, you stayed on this land, et cetera. But of course, that's nonsense if we believe in private property. Constitution, well, that's that's also easily dismissible. Like, what is that? The Constitution only means something if you own the land uh, or the property which it applies to. You can write all you want; doesn't make a lick of difference. Uh, so, so those were the the main points, the the big ones. There's more, but right. that's the gist of it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, public land. That's a, that's an interesting one. Uh, I just listened. I just finished listening to um, an episode on the History on Fire podcast. I don't know if you listened to that one. Daniele Bellelli. Oh, definitely. I, I interviewed the guy. Awesome guy. He's not an anarchist, but awesome historian. Rene, truly a Renaissance guy. He's into Taoism. He's into martial arts. He's, he's a, in, big into history. He's got, he's got this History on Fire podcast. And so he has this one series on um, Theodore Roosevelt. 
and and so Roosevelt was was the big environmental guy who who um you know wanted to protect all the land because he was a hunter right so he 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 made you know huge swaths of land federal land right he's basically basically uh what do you call it um a dictator <laughs> the guy the guy did so many executive orders he just didn't care about Congress. he just like did stuff that was blatantly you know i don't care what anyone thinks this is what i want to do and so it's kind of funny but but yeah so so it reminds me of um the, the quote by i think it's gustav malinari de malinari, de malinari um that uh um you know there's only private property and it, it, or, or public property is an oxymoron. You know, there's only private property if it's if it's if it's not private, it's stolen, right? And so mm-hmm. and and so there's no uh, there's no real um, rational basis for saying this is publicly owned. We all own it. All right. So can I walk on it? Can I? No. We all own it. So <laughs> so who decides what to do with it? Well, they do. Wait. I thought you just said we all own it. No, but they get to decide. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, so yeah, it, it, it completely yeah self detonates. Go ahead. <laughs> The the one there is like a, a little bit of a leftist argument that I'm sort of sympathetic to. It's it's the idea that uh, well, what if all the land gets taken up and and therefore it's sort of it's a land monopoly and it's sort of like a de facto state. Like well, I have nowhere to go. I have to obey the person whose land I'm on, and there's no opportunity for newcomers. I mean that's that would still be way better than a government, right? Because you you don't have overarching authority. It's it's and you also have the ability to acquire land, uh, where you can be, uh, you can I don't want to say king, but you get the idea. You can be your own sovereign, which is impossible with a state. But uh, at the same time, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Personally, the amount of land in the world, uh, not even counting oceans, uh, distributed amongst people right now, it's like 33 acres per person if you divide it evenly, but. Uh, you know, that doesn't even consider the concept of cities where you've just got millions of people basically living on top of each other, which right, right. leaves even more open land. <laughs> Do you have uh, any opinions or, or thoughts on that concept of, of the idea that uh, if there's not enough land to go around, then, uh, you know, some people say property is theft or land ownership is theft. I don't believe right, that. Right. But uh, have you ever heard that? Yeah. Oh, definitely. My um yeah, my, my mother, who's actually a big time socialist, Bernie Sanders supporter, that's, that's one of the big things. She's also, you know, very big, big into environmentalism. And so one of her things, you know, when I talk about private property and capitalism and free markets is, um, well, you don't care about forests. You think you just want apartment buildings everywhere and malls everywhere. Is that what you want? <laughs> I'm like, do you seriously think that's what's going to happen? Like, like I, there's a lot of people that appreciate the wilderness, right? And and uh, natural surroundings and forests and things like that. So that means there's a demand, right? And where there's a demand, there's there will be you you're, you're going to be goddamn right. There's going to be entrepreneurs saying, "You know what? I'm going to buy up this huge swath of land and make it into a profitable enterprise, you know, and charge people in the, pretty much the same exact way that you get charged, you know, if you go to a park, you, you pay whatever, you know, you, when you when you go in." So I completely see that, you know, and, and, and the other thing is what you said is that um, we're so far away from that. Like there's so much unused land. That's such a ridiculous idea to even entertain. Like we have such big problems right now, you know, war on terror, war on drugs, you know, quantitative easing, <laughs> intergenerational debt. These are a little bit more pressing than than, <laughs> you know, when there's going to be, I don't know, 50 billion people in the world. And then we're not going to have any more room. Okay, but we're not there yet. <laughs> it's going to be like yeah, a, couple of hundred, a, a couple of hundred years. <laughs> it's a solution in search of a problem. And especially absurd is thinking about it like, you know, 100 years ago, back in the heyday of communism, <laughs> when there were much, much less people mm. uh, in the world. There was so much land to go around, it's not even funny. <laughs> and uh, the idea that property is that, no, th- these are just opportunists who wanted to take over a factory. It's like, why do you think this land is so important? Oh, it's because I built a factory here. It's not because mm. you feel, you know, uh, that you have nowhere mm. to go. You can go to that field over there or that anyways. Yeah, that, that that idea of property is theft. That's so strange. I mean, I, I would just ask people, like, do you own anything? W- what do you own? Do you think that's theft, just you having owned something? Like, you purchased it, right? And property is the same way. It's just, it's just how do we distribute scarce resources, right? R- scarce rivalrous resources, right? Um, 
and homesteading first user you know applies more to um, large areas of land but um, you, you know, you know, economics in general is how do you distribute? You know, there's infinite desires and scarce resources. So how do you distribute this if you know everybody wants an iPhone? All right, all right. So how everybody can't get an iPhone? So how you, <laughs> how are you going to decide that? Well, you're going to have some factories make them, and people who can purchase it because they have value because they have provided value to other people so they can trade th that value to get an iPhone you know so you have to figure out how do we distribute this and you don't need bureaucrats and people you know um, old men in closed doors figuring out how people should um, should live their lives like as, as if they're like chess pieces on a board no <laughs> it's called you know peaceful interaction free trade over time um, wealth has been created because peaceful people have been allowed to trade and it's a wonderful thing and it was not micromanaged right um, you know it, you know it, it like it's amazing how much credibility people assign to politicians they're like we need somebody up there who is qualified to be the president how can you be qualified to be the president do you how, do you know all of the businesses that are in your territory do you know how they all function do you know the intricacies of all of them of course not you don't have no idea you know they pass one law to like we're going to regulate this and then immediately like like the, you know all the businesses that are affected by that they they figure out 10 ways to bypass that and go around it <laughs> and then and then oh, yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> the the um what's the word for it this is extreme uh arrogance to right, think that right. you know how to run everybody else's life or how to run the economy like right. it, it's it's absolutely <laughs> mad when you finally realize it and think about it but uh yeah jeffrey tucker once said government is presumptuous ignorant and arrogant right not only do they think that they have the right solution which is beyond ridiculous <laughs> that you could Possibly calculate value for every individual when value is subjective. I know what's good for you right now in your personal life circumstance, and that's why I'm going to force you to participate. Mm. That's already a contradiction. But the fact that they – it'd be one thing if they just said that and you could laugh at them and, and walk away. But then they force you to comply. It's, it's utterly ridiculous. So, so on this topic, this wonderful topic of megalomaniacs trying to uh, micromanage your world, uh, what do you think about li libertarians in support of, in support of Trump? <laughs> it's it's a very unfortunate circumstance, and in this 2016 election, is it's been extremely difficult and um, sort of disheartening to watch a lot of prominent anarchists uh, throw their lot behind Trump. I, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to act defensively like, oh, well, otherwise we'd have World War III with Hillary Clinton. It's like I, I, I can understand it from a tactical standpoint in the short term, I suppose. But in my opinion, you're really shooting yourself in the foot in the long term. You are aligning yourself with a politician, which is the worst thing you could ever do to spectators, to bystanders who are watching you and trying to understand what you're espousing. So it confuses people, completely blows all of your credibility and uh, consistency that you've been building up over the years. But um, it just plays right into their hands, too. It's it's all this, you know, like Jeff Berwick commented on it recently, like, like how quick, how easily scared we are into thinking in that, like, oh, yep, Hillary, World War Three. It's like there's always the doomsday. There, there's always... You know, OK, OK, you know, we got our back up against the wall. We have to sacrifice our principles right now. But in the future, we'll get right back to that. Just <laughs> trust us. Right. And it never happens. <laughs> and so I, I don't buy that. It's the same thing as like, oh, we have to raise the debt ceiling or else, you know, it's going to be the end of the world. Like, no, you need to stop the addiction right now. If you can't stop right now, you're not ready. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I I. I don't support Trump. I didn't vote, and I'm proud of that. And uh, to everybody who, who's of the idea that, well, one of the two is, is going to win, so you have to choose one, that's a, a utterly self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. They're only going to win because you keep lending them legitimacy mm -hmm. and speaking about it like it's going to happen and that we have to abide by it. No, they, they, they only have the power that you give them, and you are entrenching us further in the concept of the state when you vote and when you obsess over politics and um, it just like it's cringeworthy to imagine what their leftist friends are thinking like they are done for in terms of appealing to the left. If you supported Trump, in my opinion, 
your credibility is is completely gone to those people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had people comment on my channel, uh, my page, saying, um, you know, what do you think about Trump? And I have no specific um, opinion about any of his policies. I don't take anything he says seriously. I don't take anything any politician says seriously because my one question that I ask anybody who asks me about this is, do politicians lie? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. And if it's yes then how can you ever trust anything of what they say, regardless of how good it sounds? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing how people just take what he says on face value, you know? And, like, what, what do you think, like, what, um, um, why do you think he's ever going to keep his word? <laughs> he has no, um, no real reason to keep his word. I mean, that's that's the thing about being president. You know, you're you're the man. You're the you're the you're the mass murder in chief. Who cares what anyone else thinks after that? You know, sure, I guess you're going to be impeached, but you know, not after you have you know destroyed the lives of millions of people. You know, maybe. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's 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 really sad how how um people have have degenerated into support for him. Um, and I I yeah I mean I just. <clears throat> I just talk about I basic things. I talk about philosophy, morality, economics, principles. That's it. You know, I don't talk about. I I stay away from current events. I stay away from politicians because those things change night and day, every day. They're fickle. No, it's not important to me. You know, what's important is you know when I'm talking to the individual, I say, how do you live your life? What are your what are your morals? What principles do you stand by? What principles do you defend? What would you protect, life and limb? What would you lay down your life for? That's what's important to me, not what some power-hungry psychopath is trying to say to get power, the reins of power, so that he can you know, carry out his whim. No, that's not important to me. That's not going to affect my life. And I tell that to anybody who, who asks me about any, any politician. It doesn't affect me. You know, I, All I can have control over is my own thoughts and my own actions. And and that's kind of the the message that I tell people is that's what you can control. Focus on that. Improve yourself. Improve your life. Um, you know, gain new skills. Raise your children peacefully, moral, morally, and compassionately. That's how you improve the world. Not by electing some other power hungry sociopath to to carry out his whim, because that's exactly how genocide happens. How mass murder and democide happens is by doing that by placing your faith in these psychopaths. <laughs> yeah it's uh it is a refreshing message to hear for sure uh you know you that that's kind of how people get into the movement i think you can kind of lure them in with politics but um after a while uh, you you eventually convince them or or they see once they become awoken enough, it, it becomes apparent. You know what, all these politicians talking, you know, I used to be so enthralled in the debates and it was just like, you know, watching some kind of hypnotizing sports game. And now it's, it's like causes me physical discomfort to watch these people because it's just thickly layered fallacies and lies. <laughs> like, right. like there's just so much there. Like when Hillary Clinton talks or when Donald Trump is like, the moment they open their mouth, they're like, there's so many bad assumptions and, and half truths and quarter truths in there that it, it's just painful to watch. But um, you know that's a silver lining of this last election is that at least people saw that they were really getting screwed. They whittled it down to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. So I think we we did make a lot of gains uh, by taking advantage by exploiting that that desperation and the just the ridiculous nature of uh, that election. So I think there was some good that came out of it from a philosophical perspective. Yeah, I would also say another good I would say that came out of Trump winning was that uh, so many liberals were destroyed. <laughs> <There's> so much, <laughs> like so many memes you see like like of, of a mug, you know, this is for liberal tears. <laughs> it was just so funny. They were just making fun of so much. And, and even around me, I'm surrounded by liberals and Democrats and Bernie supporters and I saw people, yes, were uncontrollably weeping. I couldn't believe it. No way. Uncontrollably weeping. And and I'm like, I can't believe it. Like, that is the very definition of Stockholm Syndrome. You have fallen in love with your oppressor. 
<laughs> with the person that is promised, I will tax you more. Oh my God, I love you. I will tax you ninety <laughs> percent. Oh my God, I love you so much. <laughs> Please keep. Well, you know what they. I don't like to be mean, but those people, the totalitarians, which, you know, that's the left, basically. At least the right, they kind of get, like, limited government. The left, they would have just as easily turned around and locked your ass up in a cage for tax evasion or for any any number, disobeying any one of their million edicts. So they really got a tiny taste of their own medicine. So like, you want to force your will on other people? Well, you deserve it tenfold, and you you're going to get that. To some degree. So, you know, that was a little bit of sweet revenge uh, or uh, living vicariously through the the Republicans. But, uh, <laughs> you know, at the same time, you know, you, you sort of feel bad for them. And, and it's an opportunity to appeal to them and say, yeah, you know, this Trump guy, uh, what a disaster. And, uh, you know, empathize and open up from that. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story. My um, um, my mother, um, she she was asking me, what do you think about Trump? I'm like, eh. I'm like, what, 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 what? she's like, wouldn't it be nice if Hillary Clinton was elected? I'm like, why? What difference does it make? I said, I don't care if the mass murderer has a penis or a vagina. I just care there's a mass murderer. <laughs> That's all I care. <laughs> it's like there's a meme. There's a meme. It's like the mass murderer. There's a mass murderer loose. Do you care? Do you care if he's a uh, if he's uh, a, a Christian or a Jew? No. <laughs> <laughs> he just cares the mass murder, and she's like, "Well, it would have been nice because you know the glass ceiling and women can't go up." I'm like, "Oh my, <laughs> oh brother, <laughs> I'm sorry." It, oh. Yeah, parents can be tough. Uh, I, I've had my own struggles, and it, it's it's challenging and a little disappointing at times. But you know, it, I'm I'm not one of those guys who believes in defooing. You know, back when Stefan Molyneux was Mr. Hardcore Libertarian. Um, you know, before he completely sold out, in my opinion, he, yeah. he advocated that if, if your family doesn't subscribe to anarchy, that you should uh, excommunicate yourself from them. And uh, I have to say, I'm glad that I didn't go that route because, you know, you got to be patient with people. And, right. uh, and anyways, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's every everybody's situation is different, you know, and um, maybe maybe some pe- some families are more. Um, pushy than other families and, and more intolerant and um, you know that's not the case with me either so <clears throat> I mean I mean if, if the topic of politics and government does come up I usually don't even talk because I don't even want to talk because I'm like I am so immersed in this stuff I, I can just go on for a long time just talking so I'm like I'm just going to let them talk you guys talk I'll just be over here playing chess reading a book <laughs> you guys go ahead okay? enjoy yourselves <laughs> yeah and, and whenever they'll ask your opinion i i've noticed you just how can you even respond it, it you it always ends up being like a shocking moment for them like so what do you think about this new tax like should it be income based or gasoline and you're like uh well taxation is best and it's just, <laughs> so it, it's good you know to drop a truth bomb here and there and right. uh you know, people come to respect your consistency after a while. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have done that. I mean, I mean, a lot of the times, my my family, my um, my aunts and uncles and grandparents, they they're talking, and then they and then they ask me, "So, do you know what do you think uh, about voting?" Uh, I'm not going to vote. Oh, right. That's right, that's right. You don't believe me. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. So, do you know that vote? <laughs> so, so yeah, they kind of everybody knows my position. I'm open. Like the, this is the thing with with you and me and. And content creators, we're open about our opinions. We're not hiding, you know, in a closet, you know, scared, right? We, we're very vocal, very public, um, and we're proud of our position. And and that's what I love about uh, voluntarists and anarchists is that, you know, we are really well-read <clears throat> in our philosophy. And, you know, we, and, if, and if there's something, if there's an uncertainty in our minds that we don't understand, we research it, we investigate it. We, want, we don't want to be ignorant. <laughs> you know, we want to know. And and that's really a wonderful a wonderful trait to have. Yeah, I'm I'm very proud to call myself a part of this movement. I, I really respect and find a lot of extremely um what's the word? Very intellectually honest, um oh shoot, I'm missing the adjective here. Genuine people who are honestly seeking truth in the world. And uh, you know, that that's really important. And uh, I, 
I'm tremendously happy to be surrounded by these types of people. And, uh, you know, you're doing really great work. And I appreciate that. And, that, and that's going to go on for, you know, your videos are going to be up forever. And your kids are going to look back on this. They're going to respect you, your grandkids. You know, you're going to be like the abolitionist in the days of slavery. Hmm. And it's hard work now. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be among the uh, early adopter programs, so to speak, of anarchy. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in good company, like uh, people like yourself. Oh, I'm very proud to be. Yeah, yeah. All you, all you people are really... Um... You know, you give you give me a lot of hope and optimism for the future. That's why this is why I'm optimistic, right? Is when I talk to people like other volunteer anarchists, you know. So so yeah, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, so before we go, uh, one thing I like to ask my guests before uh, I let you go is, what is your favorite quote of all time? All right, this this is uh, maybe a little bit of a cop out or a shameless plug, but my <laughs> favorite phrase is uh, Dream Higher, and that's actually the slogan of my company. And uh, my wife came up with it, and it's not quite proper English, but I actually really like the way it rings. And it's self-explanatory, the idea that um, you should always be pushing the boundaries and expectations, and the future holds amazing things if we're willing to work for them. And uh, there's there's no, no, that's a bad way of putting it, uh, I'm all about, you know, building a better future, building a better tomorrow. And that's one of the great things about capitalism and free markets is that you are, are sort of the uh, determiner of your dest destiny as, as much as you can be. And, um, you know, I'm all about human ambition and I'm locking that as much as possible. So that's my shameless plug is that my own <laughs> slogan, dream higher, that, that, that would have to be one of my favorite uh, quotes. I like it. I like it. You know, I, I, I like to tell people that um, our life is a message to the future. And what kind of message would you like to deliver to your kids and your grandkids, right? When they look back on your life and they ask you, you know, daddy, when or grandfather, when when the United States empire was in its death throes, when it was, it was crippled by debt and and, you know, the war on terror was it was destroying people in the Middle East and war on drugs was imprisoning hundreds of thousands of people. What were you doing? Were you just paying your taxes and obeying the law, you know, or were you actually speaking up and producing content and helping to educate people, you know? And and I tell people, I hope you have a better a better answer than I was just obeying the law and paying taxes because that's exactly what most people did in Nazi Germany. The people who did not want to um, make ways, who did not want to stick out, be the nail that stuck out because they're going to be hammered down, right? Those are the people that enabled the regime. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. And that that's one thing I'm looking forward to. Uh, you know, are you going to embarrass yourself? Are your kids going to hate you when, you know, they ask you? So so now the truth comes out and anarchy is the way forward. So, Daddy, what what were you doing back? Then? Oh, I was actually fighting against that tooth and nail. <laughs> I was ignoring it. I was humiliating and making fun of the anarchists. Those people are uh, are going to be forever humiliated. And uh so I, I like that. That's a great quote. I was I was sitting in my in my safe space with my cookies and my coloring book and my cartoons <laughs> and, and my and my soft pillows. <laughs> and saying, Don't bother me. Don't bother me in here. <laughs> um awesome conversation, uh Daniel. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Um so please um plug your contact information uh if, if somebody wants to reach you to follow your work. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. Great conversation. Uh, you can find me at um, weloveliberty.com. Uh, also, through the podcast, uh, our email is flagshipfreedompodcast at gmail.com, where you just Google that. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, Flagship Freedom. Uh, yeah, that, that's the easiest way to find us. Awesome. Yes, please, everyone, check out his podcast, uh, like his page, um, follow him on Facebook because... You know, he's one of the other content creators, and we need more, as many voices as possible to spread this beautiful message. Um, we are trying to improve the world, educate the world, enlighten the world, bring peace, love, and anarchy to the world, and we need as many voices as possible. And it's so beautiful because we are not, even though we're a capitalist and we, you know, we're all about, you know, business and, and free markets and all that, all of this volunteerism, all of this content creation that we do is for free. 
right? We do this in our spare time because we love it, because we're so passionate about it, because we believe in the message and we want to spread it. That's what it, it's. It's just amazing to me that we do this for free. <laughs> I mean, it pisses off my wife, but it's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it pisses off your wife, but it, we're so great, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, I man, get, I get. Awesome. Say again. I was just saying, oh man, we're awesome. We're the best. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I just think it's amazing that that we believe in this stuff so much that we're we, we're willing to do it for free. I think you know, I get, I get some donations, but it's like negligible, you know, like, <laughs> but but, but uh, I, it's just amazing, you know. It's just like we have the privilege to live in the digital age where we can we can transmit this information you know across the entire planet where somebody in a different continent can hear it immediately and that's just some, some it's such an amazing thing that information is spreading and you know nationalism is being destroyed borders are becoming irrelevant right um and 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 so i just see statism is just it's just going it's going the way of blockbuster basically <laughs> go, go, <laughs> it, it, it's going it's going the way of 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 snail mail you know it's just going to slowly become obsolete right that's how you that's how you uh, you know as as um uh, buckminster full says you know you don't destroy an existing institution by what by by fighting against it but by creating a new system to render the existing system obsolete right and I, and i i seriously think that that the internet, the digital age, is doing that, the very thing with statism. So thank you very much for all you guys, what you do. Uh, really appreciate it. Really wonderful conversation. Um, so if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through um, my website. Um, through You can pay me through Bitcoin, Bit, um, PayPal, or Patreon. The links are below. Uh, that's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar show is all I ask. If you want to donate more, by, feel free by all means. Um, but, uh, you know, we do this for free because we love it, but um, it's not free, right? There's opportunity costs to everything we do. And um, we could always be doing something else, but uh, we choose to do this because we love it so much. So if you feel that you have gain value from this content please exchange value for value that's a capitalist way we all respond to incentives right <laughs> we're all we're all human beings in that way so um so yeah wonderful conversation so um this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and the conscious resistance.com and the the uh, seeds of liberty.com wishing everyone have a wonderful day take care bye thanks so much talk to you later Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.